Hello and welcome. Uh, before we start, could someone give us a audio check in the questions? So just a confirmation that you hear us well. All right. So I think uh, sounds going yeah. through. All right. Good. So um, hello and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, my name is Bishoy, and I'm here with uh, my colleague Yoni from the mobile mapping support team. And um, welcome to this uh, new episode of our mobile mapping webinar. Um, in today's episode, we'll be talking about what's new in TBC 530 mobile mapping module. Um, so um, you will learn today um, about the, the new mobile mapping features in 530. Um, specifically for the MX9 scanners. So we'll be talking about uh, some of the new calibration tools. Um, and uh, we're also talking about some enhancements um, that we've done to the, some of the existing tools already. Um, so you'll understand the benefits and requirements of these tools. And um, I think you should already have a basic knowledge of mobile mapping technology and the TBC data processing in order to follow up um, with a good pace uh, with this session. All right, so um, we'll be talking in the beginning um, about a quick and general overview of TBC mobile mapping, um, just to orient everybody in what we're doing here um, and uh, how the workflow looks from beginning to end. And then we'll be talking about the new features uh, with hands-on uh, demonstration that Yoni will be doing. Um, so there will be um, Three main topics we'll be talking about. Uh, the first one is the target, target picking enhancements. So these are enhancements on the registration module in TBC. Um, and then the second will be the all new, all automatic laser calibration tool. Um, and then finally, there will be the uh, manual and precise camera calibration module um, that's also implemented now in 5.30. And at the end, we'll, of course, have our questions and answers and a list of resources uh, for you in case you'd like to get any um, recording or a document from our previous webinars. So um, I will leave now the word to my colleague, uh, Yoni, and um, I will talk to you again at the end with the questions and answers session. Yep. <clears throat> Thanks, Pichoy, and welcome from my side as well. <clears throat> so let's go to the content. So let's start with the general overview on TBC mobile mapping so that everyone knows what we are talking about. So today we talk only about mobile mapping model of TBC. So this is not a general TBC webinar only only focusing on the mobile mapping. So if we if we look at the MX9 mobile mapping data workflow, uh, we start from the left uh, on the field we have a things like uh, TMI field software, we operate the system, we have the hardware, we maybe have a base station. Uh, then we move to the office part, we have a post pack where we process trajectory. And then we move to actually do the TBC, which is like the core of the data processing uh, on the MX9 data workflow. There we generate the point clouds, we uh, do registrations, we bring in control points for the registration, We colorize the data, we export the data. And after these like core uh, processing methods, then we can move to extract, uh, manage the data or so on. So of course we can stay in TBC or we can go to TMX, Trimble MX uh, software, or we can go to a third party softwares like Topodot or TerraSolid. But uh, today we are only gonna talk about the TBC, which is kind of in the middle of, of it all. A uh, couple notes before going going forward. So the, the mobile mapping model we talk about today is designed only for processing Trimble MX9 data. So it's not supporting any other manufacturers of mobile mapping systems and it's not uh, supporting the other Trimble mobile mapping systems. So it's only designed for MX9 data for now. And also keep in mind, if you want to follow this later yourself, you need to have the TBC mobile mapping bundle uh, license. Uh, so you might need to either have a trial or something if you want to try try these tools or, or the mobile mapping data processing in general. 
And if you have any questions about this, feel free to shoot them in the questions pane of the Goto webinar. But let's move forward to the new features. So the first feature we want to talk about is the enhancements on the registration and the target picking. So what is new is that we included some tools which will kind of help the users to pick the targets better. So it's not like a completely new workflow or anything. It's more an addition to the existing tools. And when we did these tools, we had in mind uh, two very typical targets our users use. So if, if you look on the center, we have a uh, Maybe the most common one, a checkerboard, which is like a black and white checkerboard laid on the ground. But also many, many users prefer to use the pure reflective uh, uh, targets, which are like uh, just a square, or actually in TBC we call them diamond. And many times there is a nail in the middle of this target. So we need to have a way to pick the nail in the middle precisely. And before we were not really able to do this in TBC. There are some other minor uh, additions as well, which I will show. Uh, so in the in the register, register run window, we have a new column in the middle, uh, which says if the target is picked or not. So it's, especially when you have a lot of targets, it's easier to keep in, uh, keep in mind which ones are already picked or which ones are not. Also, we have a, way to activate a movable limit box, which will help uh, pick the targets better in case you have a environment where you have a lot of objects and the target might be hidden somewhere in, in behind uh, something. But I think it's better to see these enhancements with hands-on, so let's move to TBC. Let's pick this one. So here I have a small data set with uh, just four targets, but it's enough to show you the, the new things. So uh, like usual, we would start with, uh, I prefer to have the 3D view open. Uh, then we can move to the uh, project explorer and pick one of the runs. Just let's pick the run one and let's register a run. And when we do this, of course, the register run window opens here on the right. As usual, we can give a name, we can give a name demo here. We can, we still have the same registration types or methods. Global and local is always, always good, good option. Then we can just add the four points I have imported. So as you see, when I select them, they turn orange on the screen. Press plus, and then we have the four control points here. <clears throat> Good. So, uh, what is new? So let's zoom into number two, or let's just select the number two from the window, and the view will center on the point number two. And uh, when when you click the point, uh, you will automatically have this window open, the point cloud smart picking uh, window. As usual, we have the default and road mark and intersected plane methods here. Uh, but the new things we added are all inside this intersected plane uh, tool. So let's select that one. Just zoom a little bit closer, and uh, we can just pick any point near the near the center of the target. And when I click, a new window will open. And this is now a new thing. Uh, so first of all, we can uh, have different options on rendering of the coloring of this this view here. So I myself, I prefer always to use the color coded intensity. I think it's the most uh, most easiest one to use. Uh, but you can also use the grayscale intensity if you're used to that. And you can use also color by distance to a plane. Uh, so that means that in this method, we generate a plane where we uh, select the uh, height value. And if you have uneven surface, this might be useful, but uh, Mostly I would stick with the color-coded intensity. Then another new thing is that we are able to filter the point view by the intensity. So we can uh, kind of modify the threshold value here on what we show. 
So as you see, when I move forward, the less reflective points are filtered out. And this might help you in some cases. Uh, but uh, as, a, as this is a checkerboard, I think it's fine to use the uh, standard view. So it's quite easy to uh, see the control point anyways. Uh, maybe a mention about this target specifically. So you might see that it's it, there's like a gap between the two black boxes. That's because there is a nail somewhere here in the middle. And especially in cases like this, it's uh, quite good to have these helping tools, which I will show you next. So you can now select from three different types of targets. So you can use just a single click, which means that you can click anywhere in the in the uh, 2D view and select the uh, X, Y coordinate like that. So if you, if you feel that you can select a nail, uh, for example, uh, well enough with this, it's fine to use this. And then you can, on the right side window, select the uh, height value. So it automatically uh, goes to somewhere in the created plane. But if you wish, based on this view, make it a little bit higher, you can click along this uh, purple line. So of course, it's not something you would do here, but uh, just as an example, you can see that the height value here is changing when I click on the on the right side window, but uh, we are happy with the what it gives us in the middle. But uh, let's check, check what the checkerboard thing does. So. This is what we would use here. So the idea with the checkerboard is that uh, we can give either a predefined dimension. So I know that this checkerboard is roughly 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters square, like uh, the total total width and height. Or you can, if you don't know, you can just uncheck that. And in that case, you just give, a, like I said, we give a center line of the target. So we click where the center line starts, like here, and then we click this ending of the center line. And it will create this uh, kind of window or a cross, cross hair here. And uh, if you're not happy with your picking, you can, in this case, if you don't have this one checked, you can uh, make it smaller. So this uh, upper, the first click stays still, and the second one is scaling and moving the, moving the window. And if you uh, right click and hold, you can move the whole or pan the whole window. Uh, if you check to use predefined dimension, it works a little bit differently. So uh, we can do the same. We give the center line like this. And we can also pan with the right uh, mouse button hold down. But now we can also like, uh, move the angle of the uh, window by clicking uh, the left mouse button. So all of this is just uh, tools to help you pick the center more perfectly. Uh, maybe quickly I can show you the diamond. So this would be the pure reflective uh, workflow. So let's say that this one, the bottom left, uh, square would be a pure reflective target and the nail would be somewhere in the middle. So in this case, we we don't do it in the same way. We do it a little bit differently. So you give a diagonal uh, line here. So you would give the first point somewhere here and the second point here, and you get the square and the uh, point is selected in the middle of the square. And in the same way, you can move it with the uh, the right mouse button, click down or hold down, and you can tilt it with the left mouse button clicks. But let's select the checkerboard again, and uh, 60 centimeters. And uh, let's say, let's say we are happy there. Then you just press validate and you have a new point. So the diamond symbol is the point we picked and the triangle is the expected location of the control point. 
So as you saw, when I picked the control point number two, now we have a picked uh, item here, which will show us that it's picked. Uh, maybe one thing more to show, when you press the activate limit box, a limit box is created automatically around the control point. So the control point expected location is in the middle. And of course you can move this as you wish. And the uh, limit box will move when you uh, go to another point, but it will always be the same uh, default size. So you will need to change the size of the box as you wish. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So that was it about the registration enhancements. I think they're quite useful tools for a more precise picking of the targets. So we get rid of some picking error there with these tools. And the next thing, which is maybe a little bit more uh, complex topic, I would say, is the laser bore site calibration. So what it is and why and when we would do this. So laser bore site calibration is necessary when uh, orientation of the laser or lasers has been physically changed. So as you might know, the Trimble MX-9 has a uh, uh, option that you can move the laser orientation. There's three different positions on the vertical uh, angle and three different positions in the horizontal angle. And uh, we want to support the customer do, doing this themselves and being able to calibrate lasers without uh, contacting us in the support. And this is why this tool was created. Another case where you might need to recalibrate the laser is when a laser has been replaced. Uh, mostly, of course, this would be done by the support team or service team at the moment. Uh, if you see laser mis misalignments and no physical change has been done on the system, please do not do the laser calibration before contacting the support to figure out why there is a laser misalignment. Another option would be to check the trajectory processing. For example, maybe you used GUMS in the processing and this leads to some misalignments on the lasers. So it's good idea to ask us in the support first before going forward with the calibration. So what is laser boresight calibration? It's simply precisely determining the orientation of the lasers. So it's not enough to say that, okay, our laser is in 90 degrees because really it's something like 90.111376 degrees. And of course, we want to know this as precisely as possible because we are doing measurements. And even a small angle error will lead to some error, more error in the actual point cloud. And how we do this, uh, we need to collect data which is suitable for calibration and we use the new calibrate laser scanners tool in the, in the uh, TBC to do this. So you might ask what are the bore side angles? It's maybe a little bit strange word. It's simply the heading, roll and pitch angles of the, of the laser scanner uh, in regards to the internal coordinate system of the MX-9. So heading is simply seen on the left and pitch and roll on the right. Uh, if we take an example case where we have changed the laser orientation of the MX-9, uh, before going into TBC, you should, uh, in, in the TMI field operating software, you should go to the central settings and change the uh, setting for the laser. So as you see here, uh, when you select laser left or laser right, you see uh, these sliders, which will, uh, which you have to move according to what is the real orientation of the laser. And you can check the real orientation from the markers on the MX-9 body. So there's one, two, and three, uh, both in vertical and horizontal. So this is something you need to do, just that the <coughs> TBC will have a, like a, first guess for the for the laser orientation. It's just iterated to a uh, more precise values. A uh, couple words about the calibration data requirements. So it's not possible to do 
a laser calibration on any data, but there are specific requirements requirements on the data. So uh, the calibration site uh, it must be a crossroad, not any intersection, but a two roads crossing each other. It must be near a base station, so less than 20 kilometers or maximum 20 kilometers from a base station. Uh, the crossroad should have, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, plenty of flat surfaces at different distances and inclinations, and it should have a low obstruction to genus and laser beam. So, for example, not too much vegetation which will interfere. <coughs> uh, some data capture requirements uh, we need four runs so one run in each direction of the crossing uh, the runs must ideally extend more than 40 meters apart from the crossroad and of course it's a good idea to avoid uh, crossroads which have high amount of traffic or, or the time of the day with high amount of traffic because any passing cars will will be visible in the point cloud and this might interfere with the calibration. <coughs> so this is an example an insufficient calibration sites. On the left, yeah, it's a crossing. It's uh, not too much vegetation, but uh, what we are missing here is buildings. Uh, there's only one building in this area and uh, it's not enough for uh, calibration. On the right side, we, yeah, we have a lot of buildings, but this is not a real crossing, it's a T intersection. Also, there's a bit too much vegetation in this area. For cute examples, on the left is uh, actually a real calibration site we use near our office in Germany. So the intersection in the middle, not the one with the roundabout. It's very good because there are <clears throat> multiple inclined roofs with different uh, angles, different distances. There's not too much vegetation and also not too much traffic in this area. It's, uh, it's a residen residential area. On the right side is something which is okay as well. It's maybe not as good as the left one, but still maybe sufficient. So it's a big, bigger crossing and uh, some industrial or commercial buildings there. Not too much vegetation and so on. So it's that that would could be fine as well. So when you capture data, make sure that you collect the crossing on four separate runs. Not like this that you drive around uh, like the figure eight or something and everything is inside one run. Even though we can now split runs in TPC, it's still better to do the one on the left. So really cut the runs in the field. <clears throat> and as I said, it's good to have these runs at least 40 meters. Uh, minimum is 20 meters, but 40 meters will be used for the calibration. More than 40 meters is not used. So only on the part from the middle to uh, apart uh, from 40 meters is used for the calibration, but it's not a problem to have more. And 20 meters is enough, but you get more reliable results with the 40 meter length. Uh, a couple notes on the post-processing before going to TPC. It's good to use the <clears throat> single base or the smart base, base processing. The nearest physical base should be less than 20 kilometers. So it's good to use a real base station, not a virtual one. And an important thing is to turn the guns off in the post-processing, just to get rid of any, any guns-related heading errors in the data. So time for another hands-on. So let's move to TBC. And uh, let's take this one. So let's check the plan view first. So uh, here is actually the area I showed on the left in my slides, and this is the intersection we use. If I change the color, you will see quite nicely that, uh, sorry, let's take this first. So I wanted to show you uh, just an example how the data with some laser misalignment might look like. 
So here are points from two different scanners, one in red and one in green. And as you see, the uh, other of the scanners is a bit like a, above the other one here on the on the ground level. And maybe if we look at the buildings, you see the same uh, same that it's not really matching quite well. So this could mean a laser misalignment. And it's something we want to get rid of. And uh, if I close the limit box, you can, you can see the data a little bit better. So uh, the area looks like this. So we have uh, quite nice planes here where the calibration can be done. And if we want to start the calibration, so you need to <clears throat> generate the scans, of course, first. Uh, here there are four runs, which are runs five to eight. I've shown them. So the two going here and the two going here. And if we start, want to start the calibration, we just go to the Project Explorer. Uh, we go under Capture Devices. We can select either Laser 1 or Laser 2, it doesn't matter. Right click and click the Calibrate Laser Scanners uh, tool. And then a new uh, window will open. And you, next, we need to select the four runs we use for the, for the uh, calibration. So five, six, seven, and eight, like that. Run selected four. Uh, it will show you the uh, initial calibration values. And when we are done, it will show also something else I will show, show you soon. And simply, we would start the calibration by pressing compute. Uh, this operation takes some time. Uh, I did, did this exact uh, calibration this morning and it took in my computer less than one hour, maybe 45 minutes. But in some computers and maybe also depending on the date, it might take half an hour or two hours. So maybe something between there. Okay, so I would press compute. And let's move to another TPC project where we see what's what's seen when you are done. So this is the same crossing as you see. And uh, now we're finished. So we see for the both lasers, we see the uh, current calibration values and the new values we calibr uh, or computed. And as you can see, there are some, let's say, minor changes, but still significant. And you also get some statistics, so you get overall overlap. This means uh, out of all the planes which were detected in the point cloud, how many planes were used for the actual calibration. <coughs> and the overall RMS uh, is giving the matching between these planes. Also, what we can see is the uh, scan matching between the parallel runs, so five and six. Uh, we see RMS values for tangential, orthogonal, and vertical uh, directions in 20 meter, 20 meter sections. So this is also something which might give you some idea of the quality of the calibration. But the very important thing is always to have a visual check of the calibration. So when you press the open cutting plane view, you will have this view opened here. Uh, as you see, the uh, TBC will create the 40 meter or let's say 80 meter section of the scans and update the point cloud based on the new calibration. And this we can use for evaluation, evaluating the uh, calibration quality. So you need to be sure that you enable on the view, view filter manager the latest. Uh, scans for this run. So as you see for runs five, six, seven, and eight, we have four scans, so two per scanner. But for the other runs we didn't use, we just have one per scanner. And in the in the cutting plane view, you might want to just check, like, like I showed you before, the uh, ground. So here the colors are purple and like uh, red wine red for the two different scanners. So you can see that there, I hope you see it well, maybe I'll make the 
point cloud size even bigger so they are aligning very well in the in the uh, walls in the crown and so on so this very important step on the calibration quality check and you can move along the trajectory with the slider here and in the 3d view you can see where the where the plane is created so when I move, you can see the plane also moving. And if you're happy with the new calibration, you just press apply. And then you can close. Uh, what you need to do after that, you can go to the mobile mapping model. Uh, you can update the scans of the whole mission, for example, if you want to use a cali new calibration of the whole mission. So I would uh, update all of the scans. Uh, you can check the mobile mapping report, so I click here, and the new war site calibration values are also stored here. So here is the initial one and here is the new one. And we can see the date of the calibration is today morning and the description is scanner calibration. And some statistics are stored here as well. Another thing you should do probably is that you would go to TBC because of course if you do a calibration you want this calibration to be stored also on the MX9 hardware itself to have this calibration on all future data sets. In this case you should export mobile mapping calibration which uh, creates uh, or we use a uh, existing uh, JSON file like this and we kind of add another uh, calibration to this file and this file is something which stores all all the history of the calibration uh, until the or all of the calibrations which are ever been done for the system and this uh, JSON file can be put on a USB stick this USB stick can be put on the control unit of the MX-9 and then in the TMI admin interface you can update the calibration. Okay, I hope I didn't forget anything. I think it's mostly covered now. So let's go back to the slides. Again, if you have questions, feel free to ask them on the questions pane and we will take them in the, in the end in 15 minutes. So uh, the last thing uh, is the camera boresight calibration. So why would we why would we do this? In the same way, a recalibration is necessary after changing the camera orientation or replacing a camera. So uh, on the right side you see a bad camera calibration, and on the, on the below you see a good ca camera calibration. So we want the point cloud and image overlay to match as precisely as possible. Again, we calibrate the bore side angles, so heading roll and pitch for each camera to get the overlay looking good. And how we do this, we again, we collect calibration data, then we use a manual cal camera calibration tool in TPC. And again, we can update the system with the new calibration values, like we did with the lasers. So the basic idea is very similar to the lasers only the tool itself is a bit different. So again, once you changed a camera orientation, you need to go to the sensor settings in TMI and change the sliders, of the horizontal and vertical angles. You can see again, there's uh, markers on the body of the MX-9 and this will give uh, initial values for the camera calibration. Uh, what do you need? Uh, you need a data set with, of course, images from the camera you want to calibrate. You need a good trajectory with the best possible accuracy of GNSS. So same ideas with the uh, lasers. You need calibrated scans. So if your if your scans scans have been misaligned, it's not a proper reference for the cameras. <clears throat> And uh, for the camera calibration, we prefer a little bit longer runs, so maybe more than 100 meters, so that you can check the 
uh, uh, camera calibration in different locations and you can see objects far away as well. And this area should have uh, objects that allow precise boresight adjustments, so vertical edges like poles and walls and horizontal uh, lines like uh, roofs, electrical wires and so on. And time for uh, the last hands-on. So I, let's take the calibration data set. Use the same one here. Let's close the uh, this. So we start the calibration the same way. So we go to capture devices and let's, for example, calibrate the camera two, which is front right planner camera. When you right click, you get the same menu, but now you can click on the manual camera calibration. Again, a new box will open. It will tempt you to select the position of the station on the plan view. So this is the plan view. And let's select uh, the blue run here. When you click on the trajectory, a new window will open. And uh, let me, let's take another one. I will take the, uh, Take the longer run here, so the pink one here. Okay, and let's move it to a bigger box. Let's do it like this and uh, Important thing is to enable only the scans from the same uh, same run as with the images. So we don't want to see scans from run five. We want only to see scans from run eight, what we selected, like this. Uh, to simulate, let me change the first to coloring. So I prefer to use the color coded intensity here as well. And to simulate what you might see after changing the orientation, I will just put a rough initial values here on the heading, roll and pitch. So roll and pitch usually would be only zeros and heading would be 20. So this is like the initial calibration, what we get. And as you see, it's not good. It's not overlaying properly. So we can either just type in a new value so we could put 21 for the heading and click on the, another box and it will move. But uh, I think a better way is to click on a box. So let's say, for example, the heading. So the left, right direction misalignment and pressing the page up and page down buttons on the, on the keyboard will change the value. And you can see the changing of the overlay immediately on the on the uh, overlay, oh, no, sorry, in the in the window of the image and point cloud. So let's say heading would be somewhere there as a first guess. Uh, then we see there's a mismatch on the up and down direction that would be pitch. And I will, again, I'm clicking the page down button now. So as you can see, the pitch value is negative at this point. So it's getting closer to the roof line. So it's kind of iteration in, in the same way as the laser, only the laser is automatic, but this is something you might need to practice a couple of times to get very used and find the best way for, for yourself to do this operation. The roll angle would be seen that so that the left side is up or down if, uh, comparing to the right side of the, right side of the, uh, overlay. So that would be a rough calibration. It's not perfect yet, so you might need to spend more time, but I, I hope you get the idea from this, this example. And the same same idea goes for all of the cameras. It goes for the left, left uh, front camera, it goes for the back down camera, it goes for the 360 camera. But mostly I would expect you to need to use this on the planar cameras because these are something you can change. And as a reminder, it's always good to check the orientation also on the other location of like locations of the run. 
so that you are sure that the values match also also elsewhere. I went too far away from the area. So maybe as an example, let's take, let's go there. No, wrong direction. Okay, there. So you would, need, you would want to check the alignment also on other locations and even on the other runs. And these values are stored on the on the fly, so you can just close the window when you're happy. And similarly, again, in the mobile mapping report, you see the new uh, values. So uh, calibrated camera two, front right. The date of calibration is just now on uh, finish time. And uh, new values are, are here. And also in the same way as the laser calibration, we can export the new calibration to a JSON file, like I showed. So it's quite quite simple in the end. All right, back to presentation. That's the last hands-on. So in the end, I, I like to talk about a couple of resources regarding TBC and mobile mapping. So where to find knowledge about TBC and where to find knowledge about Trimble mobile mapping on the on the internet. So first of all, if you if you are interested in using these tools, and you don't want to watch this webinar again, we have a shorter three minute videos prepared for all of these tools. They're on the YouTube. So if you search by this, this name, you will see find a YouTube video. Maybe I can quickly click and you will see. So it's uh, in the Trimble mobile mapping channel. Uh, also in the TPC help, uh, there are uh, of course, uh, instructions on, on the usage of these tools. So that's a good resource always to check. Uh, of course, beyond mobile mapping, we have a lot of other new enhancements on TBC 530. It's not, these are not covered by our group, but uh, there are a lot of videos, a lot of uh, other TPC resources. Maybe an interesting one could be scale factors and point clouds in TBC as you work with mobile mapping data and other point clouds. Uh, then about the YouTube channel, so we have two YouTube channels. The first one is a uh, Trimble mobile mapping YouTube channel. In this channel, everything related to mobile mapping is kind of stored. So it's not only a TBC mobile mapping things, it's also TMX, it's uh, workflow-based uh, webinars, it's field-based webinars and so on. So you can find this by just searching Trimble mobile mapping on YouTube. Another one is uh, TBC Geospatial channel, where we have everything related to TBC. Also those videos I showed just a couple of slides before. So also a very good resource to, find, find, uh, to learn a new workflow, for example. Uh, of course, TBC webpage, so trimble.com slash TBC. This place to download the latest installation of TBC. Uh, manuals, bulletins, white papers, and so on. Uh, all the best Trimble geospatial webinars are also stored in the uh, Trimble site, in addition to the YouTube. So any any Trimble geospatial webinar is found on this site. And you can just watch any of them free. You just have to enter your credentials or uh, your uh, email address to see them. A uh, couple words about the next mobile mapping webinar. So we're still doing quite a lot of webinars. I think even one or two per week at, at the moment. So the next one would be day after tomorrow. Uh, it's unfortunately on the night time for the US customers, but uh, for European and Asian customers, Middle East customers, it's nicely on the daytime. So it's about mobile mapping data facilitating automated traffic sign inventories in Finland. Uh, and the second one is next week. Uh, it's like this, it's hosted two times. So I hope you find a good time from these two. And uh, it's uh, one of the mobile mapping essential series, so more workflow-based series than these technical webinars like this. 
and this is about land mobile mapping for rail applications. Another, I think both are very, very interesting ones. Okay, thanks from my side. Now it's time to look on your questions with Bishoy. Bishoy, yep. do you want to take care of reading the questions? Yeah, sure. So uh, we have uh, received a couple of questions and now it's also a very good time. If you have anything, please write us and we will be happy to uh, to answer all of these questions. So um, the first question that came was, at which values would you call the lasers misaligned? And um, we should check the data with Trimble support. So um, it's a very good question. Um, it's basically asking about the conditions where you as a user um, basically suspect that something is wrong with the calibration. So we would say um, it, within a distance of 20 to 30 meters from your trajectory, um, the lasers in general, uh, the right and left, and um, we have to say under good conditions, and we have to be very careful with this under good conditions. The laser should be always touching each other. So the right and left should be always touching each other. Um, so this could be, uh, for example, if the texture of the walls of the buildings or uh, the street surface or, or any surface, if this texture is not very smooth and it's usually not smooth, then the walls appear at a certain thickness. Um, so this thickness, of course, is within the, the laser beam error. And in general, what you would see is that um, the wall has a thickness of maybe uh, three to five millimeters, something like that. And also when it's scanned from the other laser, it has another thickness of three to five millimeters and they would be touching each other. If they are not touching each other, um, then you should start immediately questioning the quality of your trajectory, um, the quality of the heading at this area, maybe start questioning the conditions. Maybe you've just uh, exited a bad Genesis area um, or uh, you suddenly uh, were driving for uh, in a straight line for a really long time. Um, and in these conditions, there might be a small misalignment. So uh, I cannot give you an exact number, but um, I would say when the lasers are not touching each other, then you should start um, questioning everything else. And if you really cannot find um, any other reason, then you could uh, just send us an email, uh, open a case, and then we would look into the data and see what's happening. Uh, but it's also expected that um, at higher distances, um, the lasers definitely will start to uh, get away from each other. Um, so at 50 meters, at 100 meters, you might still see maybe a centimeter or two centimeters difference between them, but that's completely within the system specifications. So I hope this answers the this question. It's it's a very complicated question, but it's also a very good one because it gives you an idea about the quality of the data and when and when not to to look into these errors. Um, all right. So moving to another question: um, um, Is it now possible to export Topodot, or should we still wait until update of TBC 530? So We've been working with TBC 530 now, so this is the one that we have been uh, working with uh, in the, in the hands-on. And um, there has been um, a hot fix, or uh, we call it a silent update, um, that was released uh, recently, the past week. So that was 530.1, and this one fixes the uh, latest issues with the topo.export. So uh, please make sure you get the latest 5.30.1. Um, release of TBC that fixes these uh, issues with the topo.export. Yeah, and I think if, if you have trouble finding this installation file, you can just send us an email and we will take care to deliver you yeah. this. Yeah, I, I think the link was distributed last week, but it was a local link. And uh, I think the link now is made public and it was uploaded on the Trimble's website. So it should be available now. Yep. All right, so um, moving to another question here. Uh, what about smart picking of corners of reflective targets? Any tools coming up there? So we've been always looking into, into the multiple um, shapes on targets. And um, every time we see and hear something new coming, so we want to have kind of like inventory of what are the most used ones. So until now, 
I cannot say for sure if there is something coming or not, but it's definitely something to consider. So I'm going to write this down. I'm going to raise it to our developers. And when we see a need um, for that, we always uh, try to implement it. So of course, the, the higher uh, priority, uh, the most needs were for the simple uh, checkerboards or diamond shapes. Um, but now we also see um, requests for other types of, of shapes. Some people use corners or um, triangles or rectangles. So um, I'm definitely going to write this down. And um, yeah, I, I hope it will be implemented soon if there is definitely a need for that. All right. Um, another one. Uh, is it possible to extract a checkerboard targets even with vertical targets? Uh, yes, uh, also good question. So if uh, your target is not on the ground, but it's let's say it's in the wall, uh, we call it a vertical target in that case, um, then yes, you will be able to uh, ex um, extract the center and you will also still see the two views together. One view will basically give you the depth of the wall and the other view will just give you a 2D view of the target itself. Um, so actually what, what you saw in the slides uh, showed X, Y, and Z, and it's not always X, Y, and Z. So you could consider it as the plane where the target is located in, and then another plane perpendicular on that. So the depth of the point. Um, I'm looking for a tool to pick a point on a surface just to be clear yes sure yeah that's it's understandable yeah. all right uh, more questions um we don't have any so far but uh, please feel free All right, so it seems that we don't have uh, more questions coming. Um, uh, could we have a tool to pick a point on a surface? Um, not sure what that means, but we have the, the multiple tools to pick the target. So there is the tool to pick a point on a surface indeed, and, and this is, uh, just the default picking and then there is the uh, the plane picking which allows you to pick on a, on a, on a plane um, so yes and, and it doesn't matter whether the plane is horizontal or vertical so yes there are tools to pick on planes um, or surfaces but not the corner of the surface yeah and there I think there's a limitation if the plane is not big enough then it will not work so it has to be a little yeah. bit bigger plane yeah Yes, so it's if it's like a, a very small sign, like uh, 10 centimeters by something, um, it will be hard to detect that plane. But but yes, um, there is definitely a tool to pick on planes. Yeah, and it's called the uh, for the from the smart picker, it's called uh, planes intersection. Or intersected planes. Yeah. Okay, circuit target picking would also be helpful for manholes. Yes, 100% um, agree with you, and uh, we have uh, we have this already um, in, the, in the list of new features that or, or new targets that we would like to see. So um, it's been there, but um, I have to say as a recommendation, uh, a recommendation for you, um, the center of the manholes in in general is hard to to let's say to measure in the field as a ground control points hard to pick um and might not be very stable so uh we don't recommend in general using a center of a manhole as a target so the target must be uh, it must be your absolute truth it must be the absolute reference that is the most stable one and um where you can always pick it very precisely so a center, even if, when you're in the field, uh, that, that center point of the manhole, it's not always there, might be there today, might not be there tomorrow. Um, so we always recommend using um, something like a square, where you just simply could nail something in the middle or simply put your uh, tip of the pole 
at the center of it and measure at the intersection of the white and black tiles. Okay, so I think um, there are no more questions here. And um, yeah, I think we've reached now the end. So um, I would like to thank you again very much. And um, would like to remind you also that uh, there will be definitely an afternoon session uh, for Americas. So uh, feel free to join there again. We'll be discussing the same information. Um, and uh, also we'll be always uh, coming up with, uh, with new uh, topics for the, for the webinar. So next month, there will be a new episode, more technical uh, related topics. Um, so please stay tuned and wish you a great day and um, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, all.